What do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> there's a few youngsters with us this morning. There's some babies, there's some uh, elementary school, uh, junior high individuals with us this morning. Uh, that question normally applies you're sitting around the, the table at Christmas time or Thanksgiving or Easter or you're with family. Uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? When I was a kid, I believe it or not, I wanted to be an astronaut. And uh, I, my mother always used to say to me, uh, uh, my twin brother, Carl, very good looking, by the way. Um, I know what you're thinking. He's fraternal, right? He was. <laughs> he is, I should say. He would say, oh, not me. That's too dangerous. Too dangerous. Um, my twin brother, by the way, wanted to be a professional basketball player. He was all county. He was a very good basketball player. But, uh, you know, that's such a competitive, uh, just to go to college, to play in whether it's a junior college or maybe even a, a small college like a Lemoyne or even a, a major university like Syracuse, it's so competitive. And then to make it in the NBA, it's a dream. Very few people can do that. What did you want to be when you were a kid? Anybody? You wanted to be happy? Still working on that one? <laughs> He's happily married. His wife just said he's very happy. <laughs> Thank you for that, Lady Di. I appreciate that. Anybody? Race car driver? A vet. A, vet. a, teacher. a teacher? Yeah. And we have all these hopes and dreams. And, uh, you know, it's never too late to fulfill your dream, no matter how old you are. I have some examples. A man named uh, Harlan Sanders bought his first chicken store when he was 30, 62 years old. He was 62 when he bought his first chicken stand that became Kentucky Fried Chicken. Several, several years later, he sold his franchise in the 60s for $2 million. $2 million doesn't sound like a whole bunch today. It, it sounds like a lot to me, to be honest with you. But $2 million in the 60s was a lot of money. You know the name Ray Kroc, right? He bought a hamburger stand from a, some two brothers named the McDonald's brothers. He was in his 60s. Actually, uh, he went on to be one of the largest franchises in the world. McDonald's hamburgers. I'm in, uh, I'm in Colombia, in Cartagena. I go to the mall. There's a McDonald's in the food court. I'm in uh, central Germany. I was near Eisenach, where uh, Luther was a castle there, where Luther, Luther translated the, the New Testament into German. And we get off the road, and I, I, there, was two, there were two food places right there in Eisenach. On one side was a German cafe, on the other side was McDonald's. Lucy goes, where do you want to eat? I don't want to eat at McDonald's. I can do that in the United States. I want to try what they got. They had, they had the special bread. I'm kind of going off script here. Can you, can you tell I'm on a diet? <laughs> I talk about food. Special bread with butter, salami and cheese with cucumbers. I thought, gosh, that's kind of strange. I never had anything like that. I still eat it to this day. That was like in 1997. I love to eat salami and cheese with cucumber with butter on a, on a nice bread. Anna Marie Robertson Moses started painting at age 78. Her dream wasn't too old. She wasn't too old for her dream. Anna, Mar Anna Mary Robinson Moses started painting at age 78. We know her as Grandma Moses. Grandma Moses lived to be 101, so she painted for some 23 years. And one of her paintings called uh, Sugaring Off, I'm not sure what it's about, Sugaring Off sold for $1.2 million. She was su successful past the age of 78. We're continuing our study of the book of uh, Hebrews. And remember, the basic theme of Hebrews is better. Christ is better than anything you can compare him to. Whatever, you, whatever, you co whatever comes in your mind, a relationship, a career, finances, money, a house, whatever you can compare Jesus to, Jesus is always better. Last time we looked at Christ, that he was not only highly recommended by the Father, but he was highly qualified. 
He was highly recommended in, in, by people he interacted with, like the woman at the well and so on. He's also highly recommended by just historical persons like Napoleon and so on. Christ was highly recommended and highly qualified to be our high priest, the priest of our salvation. Today, as I thought about our text, I prompted a question in my mind, what are you going to be when you grow up? Because it's time, hear me, beloved, it's time that we grow up. When it comes to the faith, the time has gone for us to be immature, to be, to be uh, underdeveloped. The time has come for us to grow up into Christ, to be mature. What are you going to be when you grow up? If you have your Bible handy, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to pick up in verse 11, just verses 11 to 14 today. Hebrews 11, five, excuse me, chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. We're going to talk about the issue the uh, immaturity and the explanation that the writer of Hebrews has for us. Beginning in verse 11, notice what the writer says in relation to this issue. About this time we have much to say. And it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. We have a lot to say about Melchizedek. Now he just introduced the topic of Melchizedek. Uh, earlier in this chapter, and we'll get more into who he is in chapter 7. But he says, we have a lot more to say about this individual, Melchizedek, this priest of God, who the psalmist David says in Psalm 110, the Lord has sworn and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Christ can also be, he's from the royal tribe of Judah. He's not from the priestly tribe of Levi. He's from the royal tribe of Judah, but he can also be a priest because he's a priest at the order of Melchizedek. So he's our king, prophet, and priest, right? We have a lot to talk about in relation to Melchizedek. <coughs> Pardon me. He's not just an introductory issue when it comes to the faith, but they've become dull of hearing. Listen to some of the phrases that are used in other translations when he says, I have a lot to say. I want to explain it to you, but you become dull of hearing in the English Standard Version. Other versions put it this way. You're lazy and sluggish when it comes to the Scriptures. You're poor listeners. You're not wanting to understand. You're spiritually dull and do not seem to listen. In the Spanish, it goes like this. Lo que les entra por un oído, that which goes through the ear or into the ear, les sale por el otro, goes out the other one. What comes in one ear goes out the other ear. It doesn't stick in there. We, we have a saying like that in English, right? In one ear and out the other. That which enters into one ear, through one ear, enter, uh, leaves through the other ear. Let's face it, there are some uh, elementary issues in the faith and some things that are more advanced. The gospel, hear me, beloved, every person here must be able to explain the essentials of the gospel. The fact that we're sinners, we're separated from God, that God loves us, that he sent his son Jesus Christ who died upon a cross to pay for our sins, and that he rose again the third day, and that if we put our trust and faith in what God did on Calvary, we are redeemed. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, you're saved. Like it says in Romans 10, if you confess your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Every person here should be able to give a short sum summary of what the gospel's all about. Every person here must be able to give a short testimony. We've talked about this many times, a 15-second a testimony. We've done this before, and I've told you my 15-second testimony. When I'm talking to someone in the store and they, they're complaining to me about their life, I can say, can I tell you what God did for me? Sure. In a store, in the marketplace, on the road, at the park, you, many times you only have a short snippet of time. I have this 15-second testimony. There was a time in my life where I was alone and rejected. That's what I was like before Christ. But then I received Christ's forgiveness and made a decision to follow him. Now, 
I'm loved and accepted. See, it takes 15 seconds. And you, do you have a story like that? Oh, I like to say, do you want a story like that? Do you want a story like that? We should all be able to explain the essence of the gospel and give a short testimony of what God did in my life, in your life, to bring us to Christ. And it's so powerful when you tell people what God's doing for you. They go, I want that too. But there are some more complex things, like eschatology. Eschatology. It's a fancy way of saying the study of last things, the end times. And we're living in the end times, are we not? Amen. Thank you. Amen. We are living in the end times. Ecclesiology, that's the study of the church. Ecclesia. Hamartiology, the study of sin. Epistemology, how do we know what we know? How, can, how do we come to know things and that we can trust it? Epistemology. Cosmology. How the world was created. Uh, every time I look at my world, I marvel at what God has done. It's amazing what an amazing creator he is and what he's done for us and how he's made. Just go to the zoo and look at the variety of life at the zoo. Go to the other zoo down in uh, Times Square and, and look at the variety of life in Times Square, right? <laughs> So that's the issue. They're, they're dull of hearing. They're lazy. They don't want to understand because they're immature. Continuing in, verses 12, in verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, at this, at this point in your life you ought to be able to teach other people about Christ, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of the Word of God. You need milk and not solid food. You're at a point and an age where you, you should have developed enough that you could be a teacher. I remember when I was in the, in the Navy, when you qualified on a station, like when you qualified at feed station, or you qualified at end room lower level, or you qualified as reactor operator, electrical operator, as soon as you qualified, you were qualified not only to sit watch on that station, but train others. Hear me clearly. If you're in Christ this morning, you are qualified to lead other people to Christ. If you're in Christ this morning, you're qualified to teach other people about Christ. But many times we back away and say, oh, I'm not confident enough to do that. You have all that you need in Christ. This is a gentle rebuke. When for the time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again, which be those first principles of the oracles of God. Can you tell I memorized this verse in the old King James? Years ago, memorized that verse. Very convicting. This is a gentle rebuke, but straight to the point. You should be a teacher, but you're still a student. Have you ever heard of a uh, 35-year-old man living in his parents' basement. Graduated from college, but never seemed to get any traction. He works a part-time job because, you know, he just doesn't have the stamina to do a full-time job. But he has enough energy and time to play hours and hours of World of Warcraft at night in his basement. If we saw him, we would, we would want to yell at him and say, it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. You've passed the time of being a teenager. This isn't normal. This is unusual. And that's what, this is the gentle rebuke by the writer saying, you, you should be teachers, but you're still a student. It's time to move forward in the faith. You need milk. Now, Peter says in second, uh, excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. It's so important that we get the milk of God's word into our life and that we begin to develop. Do you, do you have to teach a baby how to, how to nurse? Don't they just do it automatically? You, you, you know, they, start, they get hungry. They get that, that, that hunger pain. They start crying. So whether you nurse or you put a bottle in their mouth, they, they latch on right away. They know what's coming. 
and they desire that milk, that food to nourish them, to help develop them, to take them from, listen, from just immature food like milk to more mature food like solid food, meat. That's how God has designed it. That's how we develop. We start with the milk, and then we develop to solid food. That's what he says here. You should be teachers. You have become one who needs milk and not meat, not solid food. They've become Christians for a long time. Let's go on to the explanation. For everyone who, this is verse 13, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he's a child. If you're still surviving on a diet of the milk of the word, so to speak, you're immature and you're unskilled. It's time to develop. It's time to move past that. But verse 14, but solid food is for the mature, those who are developing. And by the way, <coughs> I love peanut butter. I'll eat it by a spoonful. I'll take a spoon of extra crunchy peanut butter. And Lucy's watching me. Don't choke. Please don't choke. You know what I drink after I have a big spoon of peanut butter? A glass of milk. We never outgrow the milk of God's word, beloved. But we've moved past that. I want that salami sandwich with cheese and butter and cucumber. Can I get an amen? I want to develop and learn more about Christ, more about Jesus, more an understanding of who he is. Because believe me when I tell you, we're going to spend an eternity digesting the reality of who God is and how great he is. Why not start here in the here and now and beginning to comprehend more and more of the love of Christ? For everyone who's, who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he's a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have the powers of discernment trained by constant practice. That is, they're constantly reading God's word to distinguish between good and evil. The old King James says to discern, to discern good and evil. Now hear me, there is a gift of the discerning of spirits in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, a supernatural spiritual gift that we can have through the power of the Holy Spirit. When you look at a situation, you go, there's, not, there's something not right about that. I can't put my finger on it right now. And it's the Holy Spirit telling you through the, the gift of the discerning of spirits that there's something going on there that's inappropriate. We don't know, we may not be able to put our finger on it, but the Holy Spirit is warning us. That's not what the writer here is talking about. That's a unique gift of the Holy Spirit so that we can discern the spirits that are behind whatever the human being is saying, whether good or evil, whether it's the Holy Spirit or it's a demonic spirit. John talks about this in 1 John chapter 4. We have the Spirit of God. For greater he is he that it's in you than he that's in the world. We have the ability through the Spirit of God to discern sometimes what's going on around. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. What he's talking about here is when we get God's Word into our life and we're digesting God's Word, he gives us the ability through God's Word to observe our world and figure out what's going on. That's not right. That is right. That isn't right. This is right. That's not right. Because he gives us the boundaries that he has for us. We're able to discern between good and evil. Because we've had our minds exercised through God's Word. You're, you're, you're in a circumstance and you're, things are going on. You go, oh, this reminds me of what happened with Joshua. Or this reminds me of what happened with Peter, James, and John. Or this reminds me of what happened with Paul the Apostle when he was on the Isle of Malta. You know, as we get comfortable with the text of Scripture, as we begin to digest the Scripture, He gives us what we need in those circumstances, and we can see the parallels. Because we've had our minds, our senses, developed through reading God's Word. What are you going to be when you grow up? My hope is that you'll be a mature Christian. A lot of ways, listen, in a lot of ways, I want to stay young. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking, but infants in evil, 
but in your thinking be mature. So he's saying, hey, when it comes to evil, I want you to be like a child, innocent. But when it comes to your thinking, your processing, your meditating on Scripture and life in comparison to Scripture, I want you to be fully mature. Being young and innocent concerning the evil and corruption in our world. I want to be, listen, several ways I want to be young in the way I live. I want to be young when it comes to a sense of wonder. As I look at my world, I want to have that sense of wonder. When I, every time I come into my kitchen, you know what I do? Instant, just, it's, it's, a, it's a reaction now. When I walk into my kitchen, I look out the back window to see if there's hummingbirds at my hummingbird feeder. Because I'm captivated by hummingbirds. There's a sense of wonder there. I'll never forget when I was, uh, when Lucy and I were in the Navy, we're out in California, we're up in Northern California near San Francisco. We got sent down to San Diego for two weeks for the school that I attended. And while we were there, we took our, our uh, oldest daughter, she's the only one we had at the time, we took her to the San Diego Zoo. And we're walking around the San Diego Zoo, and Rachel saw things she'd never seen before. She saw a giraffe, she goes, wow, what's that? She saw a rhinoceros for the first time, hippo. She, all these different animals, lions and bears, tigers, oh my, you know. She saw all these things, and she was captivated in wonder. Her eyes got really big. That's how I want to live my life. I want to have a sense of wonder in what God has made in the universe. I want to be a child when it comes to this, this sense of wonder that I have. I want to have a sense of wonder when it comes to humor. Our sense of uh, being young when it comes to humor. I've been told a lot of times by different people that I'm a juvenile. Juvenile humor. Ladies, please help me here. Are your husbands more like teenagers when it comes to a sense of humor? Immature. They laugh at body noises. You know, you know how we are. Can I get an amen? <laughs> we go too far, don't we? Did I go too far? But I've quickly transitioned to dad jokes. I went from that juvenile humor of being a, like a teenager. Now, somewhere in the middle, I, I transitioned into, not that I'm transitioning, but to, to dad jokes. For example, I went to uh, Dick's Sporting Goods to buy some camouflage pants, but I couldn't find them. <laughs> See, that's not too bad, is it? Dad jokes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I want to be young in these areas. Have a sense of wonder. Have a sense of humor. But when it comes to the truth, beloved, I want to be mature. I want us to be mature. To grow up. Maybe you're thinking, Pastor, it's too late for me. I I'm just, it's too late. You know, there was a, a famous preacher. His name was Dr. H.A. Ironside. He was a famous pastor back in the, between like 1910 to 1940 or so. <clears throat> he, um, when he got saved, he wanted to read the Bible once for every year that he was alive. He got saved in his, his youth, like seven, eight, nine years old, something like that. You know, by the time he turned 14, he had read the Bible 14 times. You can read this, you, believe it or not, you can read the Bible in 72 hours, the whole Bible. You're thinking, gosh, Pastor, it's just too big. It's such a big book, it's, it's overwhelming. Look how big that book is. There's no way I can digest that. How do you eat an, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. If you start to get the Bible one bite at a time, one day at a time, for 15 minutes, you'll read the Bible in a year. You'll get through it. There'll be, there'll be parts you'll scratch your head and go, I don't understand this part. I don't get this part. Believe me, I've been a Christian, uh, let's see, how old am I now? 46 years. There's parts of the Bible that I still scratch my head and go, Lord, I don't get this part. I don't understand this. It stretches me. But having read the Bible for 46 years, the numerous times that I've read the Scriptures, I, I begin to grow and mature so that as I'm reading, oh, I remember this part. Oh, yeah, that relates to this part. And so we connect. We make connections as we read through the Scriptures. You're not too old. 
to start. Pastor, is it too late for me? Absolutely not. Think about Colonel Sanders. Think about Ray Kroc and Grandma Moses. In their 60s, they became entrepreneurs or very successful in their craft. It's not too late for you to develop your relationship with Jesus Christ so that you begin to mature. What do you want to be when you grow up? My sincere desire for you, beloved, is to be mature Christians, to develop in Christ. You know, there are Christians who are professional athletes. I think of C.J. Stroud, that guy, that kid. The only problem with him is he played at Ohio State. But other than that, he loves Jesus Christ. When he walks in the, in the stadium, he's normally wearing a shirt that proclaims his faith. C.J. Stroud is an amazing quarterback for the Houston Texans. I think of um, Tim Tebow. He's, he's a, he was a Heisman Trophy winner, played at Florida. Uh, had a short career in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the NFL, but he was an amazing athlete. He still is an amazing athlete, but it, he sincerely loves Jesus Christ and wants to follow him. There are Christians who are actors. I, I, I read quotes from Denzel Washington, and I go, man, I, I like this guy. I like his movies, too. Stephen Baldwin, who's visited our church here, his family's here from Syracuse. Him and his wife have been to our church. Loves Jesus Christ. There are Christians that literally in every area of life. There's engineers, there's physicians, there's accountants, there's tradesmen, whether electricians or plumbers or whatever, janitors, even, even politicians, believe it or not. There's Christian politicians, individuals who love Jesus Christ. I think of Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the governor for uh, um, Arkansas. Her father, Mike Huckabee, was the governor, was a Baptist preacher. She loves Jesus Christ. And so no matter what your vocation is, you can be successful in that vocation, but who you are is, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ, and I want to develop as a follower of Christ. We grow up and develop professionally, but I want us to grow up spiritually, not to be in a place where I need someone to take me through the, what it means to be a Christian, the elemental things of the faith. I want to begin to develop by reading God's Word on a daily basis. Pastor, how do I do that? How can I grow up and be mature in Christ? Well, the text tells us the primary way, listen, the primary way we develop as a Christian is by reading God's Word. Get in the habit of reading God's Word. To be skilled in the word of righteousness, which means the Bible. It can be an intimidating book. Every person here can have a basic understanding of the entire Bible. Whether you start with the first five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, you go to the historical books or the prophetic books or the poetry like Psalms and Proverbs and so on, to the New Testament. Every person here can have a basic understanding of what the Bible is all about. It's not one book, it's 66 books written by 40 different authors over 1,500 years and it has one consistent message. God loves you and wants you back. Those 40 authors over 1,500 years have a consistent message. God loves you and wants you back. You have to start reading the Bible. But do me a favor, if you start reading the Bible, don't start with a book of Genesis and try to go through book by book, because by the time you get to Leviticus, you go, I can't do this. There's a lot of Bible reading plans out there. I can connect you with one. Uh, our Daily Bread, which we have the devotion right in our, our entryway, the little booklet. In the Our Daily Bread, you have a daily devotion, you'll have a scripture that you read, and then it says Bible in a year, and it'll have uh, a New Testament reading and an Old Testament reading. Sometimes it'll have a Psalm and a Proverb as well, depending on the program. And you'll slowly begin to go through the Bible book by book, and things will start to jump off the page at you. Oh, I'm familiar with that story. If you start in Matthew and read through the New Testament book by book, you'll go, you do Matthew, and you, when you read Mark, you go, gosh, I've read that before. And then when you read Luke, you go, gosh, I've read that before, because they're the synoptic gospels. They have a lot of similar material. John's gospel is a little different. So if you were to say, Pastor, I want to start reading in the New Testament, what do I do? I would say, read first the gospel of Mark, then read the book of Acts, and then start reading some of the, uh, the letters that Paul wrote to the different churches, and I could help you with that. 
But start to read your Bible on a daily basis so that you can begin to become skilled in the word of righteousness. And it'll be amazing. You'll, you'll be amazed at what you see in life. You go, gosh, I've read about that circumstance before. What's going on in my office? I've seen in the Bible similar things, similar themes in what I'm doing. Just 15 minutes a day, you get through the whole Bible. And there are so many books that can help you. There's a book called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Just a little book. It'll help you. If you have a study Bible, the study Bible will have an introduction. It'll explain some different things. It'll have cross-references for you. Maybe have some archaeological data as you're reading through. There's just so many resources we have, especially as English speakers. We have over 100 different versions of the Bible in English. 100. Which one's the best? The one you read. The best version, beloved, is the one you're reading. You know, there's debate about which text is the best. We can get, we can, we can get off into the weeds, but hear me when I tell you, every version of the, of the New Testament in English has the gospel in it. You can't miss it. How do we grow up and mature as a, Christ, a, a Christian? Well, we read Psalm 1 this morning. Uh, Chris read Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is where? In the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. And if you do that, beloved, you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You'll bring forth your, your, your leaf will not wait, fade, and you, you'll bring forth your fruit in your season. But the wicked are not so, but they're like the chaff which the wind drives away. If you're, if you're planted by the rivers of water because of Christ, you're going to be solid and sturdy. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Get God's word into your soul, beloved. Meditate on it. That just means to think about it. You know, when I read the scriptures in the morning, when I get into my car and I start going about my day, meeting different people, doing different things, thinking about a salami sandwich with cheese and cucumber on bread and butter, God's word is in my mind, and I'm driving around thinking about it. Deep thoughts about God's word. What, it mean, what's it, what does it mean to me? Pastor, is there other ways I can grow as a Christian? Obviously doing the disciplines, Bible study and prayer and worship and fellowship and giving and so on. But I want to give you just a couple that I want you to sink your teeth into. The first one is start reading your Bible on a daily basis. Get into God's Word. A second one is, I want you to, to participate in a small group. Think of, pray about participating in a small group as we, start to try, we try to launch them in different communities where you're meeting with other believers on a, a weekly basis and praying, maybe bi-weekly, praying for people, praying for your circumstances, and watch God begin to work in your life. Prayer works. Amen? When we pray, God hears. I like what Dr. Kosher used to say. We serve a prayer hearing, prayer answering God, a wonder working God. God answers prayer. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, sometimes it's wait. But God does answer. And no is an answer, by the way. We always say, oh, God didn't answer my prayer because he didn't give me what I wanted. Maybe he's protected me from something. I want something that's going to hurt me. But participate in a small group. And here, thirdly, if you want to grow as a believer, start teaching the Bible. Start teaching the Bible to other people. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, maybe you teach a Sunday school class. Maybe you teach a WANA. Maybe you participate in Band of Brothers or the Ladies Study, and you, you get involved with the leadership of those, those activities. Or, more importantly, teaching one person. Ask God to show you a person that you can input into their life about the Lord Jesus Christ. Begin to mentor them and help them follow Jesus Christ. Every person here should or can have a mentor, someone who's helping you follow Christ, and a protege, someone you're helping follow Christ. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul says this, 
The things which you've seen and heard of me, commit to faithful men who can teach others also. Paul says to Timothy, Paul, the mentor, says to Timothy, the things that you've seen and heard of me, says that to Timothy, his protege, give to others. Give to faithful men, a third, a third generation, who can teach others also, a fourth generation. In 2 Timothy 2.2, we have the mentor-protege, mentor-protege relationship. Beloved, you have a friend or a, a connection in your life where you can begin to input into them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not complicated. Just sit down and have a cup of coffee and say, hey, what's the Lord showing you? What's the Lord showing me? What can I pray for? What, what, what can you pray for me for? You begin to have this conversation about the Lord Jesus Christ and his work in your life with this individual that you meet on a weekly or biweekly basis, and you see them begin to develop, and you develop. Nothing helps you grow more in Jesus Christ by helping guide someone else in the gospel. Look for someone and say, hey, can we start meeting on a weekly basis? Can we start meeting on a biweekly basis and just talk about our faith? Someone you're comfortable with. Just so you know, in my own life, I have four individuals I meet with every other week. And I want to help them follow Jesus Christ. I want to help them mature in Christ. And by me helping them mature in Christ, they're helping me mature in Christ. What do you want to be when you grow up? My prayer for you, beloved, is that you're a mature Christian. And you do that by reading God's Word, participating with other believers in fellowship, whether it's here or in a small group, and maybe step out of your comfort zone and see about meeting with someone on a routine basis to lead them to grow together in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen?